Home Alone 1 and 2 are comedy masterpieces. That's right. These movies are some of the funniest, greatest movies I've ever seen. And I haven't really come to appreciate how bloody great they are until recently. I grew up watching these every few years, every time they'd be on TV, especially the first one. I watched the hell out of that. I used to have it on VHS video. I used to watch it several times a year. Loved it. Could quote it till the cows come home. Same as the second one. I actually saw the second one. I had the pleasure of seeing it in the cinema when it came out back in uh, 92, I think it was. Loved that as well. And they always just were these great nostalgic movies that I always enjoyed and I never thought that much more of it. <clears throat> they were some of my favorite films growing up, but that was it. I didn't appreciate them as great works of art or anything like that. But it wasn't until recently when I started showing them to my kids and they loved those two movies. Unfortunately, they also, uh, the younger ones like the sequels that came after, three, four, or five, however many they made, and I can't stand those, but I'll get to those later. Anyway, one and two, I've been re-watching them again recently, because, as I'm sure many of you know, youngsters, once they find a movie they like, they watch the absolute shit out of it. They'll watch it over and over and over. Sometimes they'll watch it twice in a day, even, right? And so I've been watching it with them, and I've noticed how well written these movies are that I couldn't I could not appreciate it as a child watching it back in the 90s but I'm watching it now through an adult's eyes and I can appreciate how how great the uh, acting was to have a serious actor like Joe Pesci pull out a performance as comedic as that and as sort of sinister as it was as well because when I was a kid uh, I found Harry to be really intimidating he's a real nasty bastard and he played it so damn well. And and uh, Daniel Stern played Marv so well as uh, also. But just to appreciate also just how well paced these films are. It, you, there's not a dull moment in it. Even when, there's, even when there's not hijinks and gags going on. Just the interactions between people are so well written. So well acted. Macaulay Culkin was a phenomenal child actor. Amazing. He, at the same time he was hilarious, he could really pull on your heartstrings in the heartfelt moments. The scenes with old man Marley. Man, even as a kid they used to get to me, especially in the church, and when he reunited with his son at the end of the first movie. Those are very heartwarming moments. And these, that's the great thing about these movies. They actually have a lot of heart to them and a nice message about family. And about forgiveness. And the, the parents, you know, at first they feel so guilty and so terrible. And that's, that's the, like, it makes you, how the fuck do you leave your kid at home and go all the way overseas? Now, you said, I didn't fully appreciate how easily they lost him on both occasions. And it was slight errors that they made, but they just were not being cautious enough. And as parents, you cannot under any circumstances, uh, let your guard down when it comes to making sure your kids are safe and are with you, especially out in public, all right? And this movie has taught, you know, this isn't the only thing that's taught me that, but you watch this movie and, you know, it can show you how easily it can happen. So in the first movie, uh, as a kid, I, I just, I was never really paying attention much to the plot and the intricacies and the details of what was happening in the movie. I was just enjoying, you know, the funny moments and the bits with Buzz and, and, and you know, I'd always be looking forward to the traps coming at the end of each film. That, that was what great about this movie as well. They, they build up so, so much anticipation. Even if you'd seen the movie a hundred times, you still were looking forward to that whole sequence at the end of each movie where it was time for, you know, he'd set up his booby traps and it was time for Harry and Marv to cop an absolute beating. All right? And I never sat and appreciated how the story and the plot was unfolding. There's so many little details that lead up to it that you just don't notice. Like someone in a YouTube video that I watched a while ago pointed out that if you look very carefully in the scene where, uh, in the first movie, in the scene where they're having pizza and then <laughs> Buzz eats all of 
Kevin's pizza, the bastard big brother that he is in that movie. He eats all of Kevin's pizza and then immediately starts gagging and almost throwing up. And Kevin, in a fit of rage, he rushes him and slams him in the stomach, making him spew all the pizza. The drinks get spilt. The pizza gets spilt. There's all kind of mayhem going on. The parents are rushing around like a bloody headless chicken trying to pick up the, the mess. And in that chaos and that commotion, right... If you look for a split second when they're dumping hand towels in the bin, Kevin's ticket is in that bin. It got swept accidentally in the mayhem into the bin. So there's one reason why they never noticed that Kevin was missing. His ticket was gone, all right? That's that's step one of their royal uh, screw-up of leaving their kid behind. The other mistake is when they're uh, counting heads. I think they leave it to, it's either the cousin or the oldest daughter. I can't remember. I don't think she's one of the, she must be Uncle Frank's daughter. That's the other thing I never established as a kid until I watched it last time is how many siblings does Kevin have? I had no fucking idea how many bloody siblings does Kevin have. I always just knew Buzz. I didn't know if the others were his cousins or his, or his brothers or sisters. But in this one, I actually paused it on the scene where he was looking at his family photo and I could see that he had like two sisters and and I think Fuller was his brother as well. And I never noticed that as a kid. I never sat and paid attention to see that. But the other, yeah, the other way that Kevin uh, was left behind is the older cousin, I believe she was, with the curly hair, was counting heads and she counted that bloody annoying uh, neighbor's kid who was just pestering all the drivers and asking them, is this an automatic transmission? This is a manual transmission. And the driver's like, beat it, kid. <laughs> Just these little interactions crack me the hell up. I don't know. It's something about that John Hughes style writing. That guy was a brilliant genius of a writer. And Chris Columbus, who directed the first one, I think he directed the second one too. Just great, great directing, great writing all around. And so they miss... Uh, she thinks Kevin's been counted when really he's still at home and that's how they leave him behind and the other thing I didn't notice the first time I was watching is just yeah all the interactions like the one with the with the Santa the Kris Kringle <laughs> he doesn't give a shit at all about his job and he's just so half-assed about it and unenthusiastic but he ends up helping Kevin which was nice that's the thing it's the, you, there's a lot of humanity in this when the mum is desperate and no one will help her and she's pleading with that old couple and, and the man's like oh, all right and he gives her they give her their seat on the plane such a nice gesture she could have been a crazy woman but they took a chance and thought well we'll help you out you seem desperate and that was nice and she was offering them all this jewelry and stuff like that but they did it out of the kindness of their heart you know reluctantly at first but it was the Christmas spirit and John Candy, a tiny role, which apparently was only paid like 400 bucks for doing one day of filming, even though it was John fucking Candy, one of the top comedic actors in the world at the time, and I think he did it as a favor to John Hughes or Chris Columbus, and he helps out the mum as well, and I always found that really touching as well, the poker king, and he fucking, they take her in the van and she's playing the clarinet, I guess you wouldn't do that now with all the germophobia going on. But it was just heartwarming how he helps her out in such, a nice, in such a nice way. Unfortunately, because of that, you know, um, he just had that small cameo. We didn't get to see more of, uh, you know, John Candy in that movie, which would have been great. He's great in anything. But even a small cameo is great. And I can't not mention the urban legend going around that in that scene where John Candy comes to help out the mum, played magnificently by a young and quite beautiful, I must say, Catherine O'Hara, uh, Elvis Presley is standing behind her. And if you're watching the screen, he's to the right of uh, Kevin's mum, behind her. And it's a bearded guy, and it looks like an old bearded Elvis. <laughs> and the urban legend is, you know, Elvis lives, he survived 1977, and he faked his death or whatever, and he continued to be <laughs> in movies, or maybe he didn't, he just made one cameo in this film for some reason, all right? It makes no sense whatsoever. It's 99.99% 
not Elvis Presley, but uh, you know, it's fun to speculate that you know, zero point zero 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 one percent chance maybe he lived and then decided, you know, uh, oh, I'm gonna be in a, I'm gonna be in a home loan. <laughs> I just love imagining that that's him. It's hilarious. Anyway, this movie, Uncle Frank. I've got to, I've got to mention Uncle Frank. One of the greatest uncles ever portrayed on the screen. This guy was such an asshole. He was such a son of a bitch to his nephew. And he's always taking Buzz's side. Like in Home Alone 2. When they're doing the choir and Kevin's singing so beautifully. And then Buzz is like playing drums with <laughs> on Kevin's head with his with his candlesticks. And Uncle Frank is pissing himself laughing in the crowd. Like it's the funniest thing he's ever seen. And that when I see people laughing hysterically, even if what they're laughing at is not that funny, it's almost like the laugh contag like hysterical laughter is contagious to me. I can't help laughing when I see someone laughing hysterically. So I'm pissing myself at Uncle Frank. He's pissing himself at Buzz being an asshole, and then Kevin retaliates as usual, destroys the whole set, and knocks out the piano playing woman. And as usual, Kevin cops the entire blame. And even <laughs> and then Buzz gives his impassioned speech because you know they got to do the apologies, and it was all fake because you know whispers whispers to Kevin after he's done his, you know, I'm sorry, Kevin. He whispers to him, beat that, you little trout sniffer. <laughs> I always thought trout sniffer was a funny, uh, a funny, uh, you know, line as a kid. I never understood what it meant. And thinking about it now, is that like some kind of bloody innuendo? Some kind of euphemism? A trout sniffer? I don't know. I don't know. It is a kid's movie. I don't want to, you know, I hope it's not that suggestive. But either way, the way he delivers that is hilarious. And then... Kevin calls him out on his bullshit, and even, you know, when he's, when, when Buzz is apologizing and he's like, uh, you know, what I did was immature and it was not funny, and then Uncle Frank the asshole is like, not funny, it was goddamn hilarious, <laughs> he's such a prick, get out of here you nosy little pervert, or I'm gonna slap you silly, one of the greatest lines in the, in the second movie, it's so damn quotable that's the other thing about how good this movie is man this is a rambling ass review but i just these are my thoughts on home alone one and two and i just like to let them vomit out of me <laughs> as they come all right i'm all over the place here i'm jumping between one and two just whatever comes to my head about these movies i love to ramble about it but that whole sequence where he gets that's the other thing that i love about these movies they've made kevin an absolute genius He's still a kid, acts like a kid, but strategically, he's a genius. He comes up with ideas and strategies and plans that, you know, even some adults would never think of. Like the whole bypassing, uh, paying for the room by recording himself and then playing it slow. So it sounds like he, he's an adult, you know? This is Peter McAllister, the father. <laughs> Every time I hear that voice of the of the the dad recording that he uses, credit card, you got it. <laughs> it's so so fucking funny, and it's a genius. You know, it's like he anticipates what they're gonna ask him for information wise, and he knows everything to say. So he just records it and then plays it and pauses it, and it, and ah. Oh, Got to, you got to mention the genius way that he uses those movies, those fake movies within a movie. When I was a kid, I didn't know they were fake movies. You know, uh, Angels with Filthy Souls. And then in the sequel, Angels with Even Filthier Souls. I thought these were real gangster movies. And that that guy was a real actor from the, like the 1940s in, in you know, noir crime uh, movies. But no, they, ma they, they were fake movies made up for the film for Home Alone but it was genius the way he used it like with the pizza delivery guy in the first movie just leave it on the doorstep and get the hell out of here <laughs> uh, and then and then he pays for it like the guy goes you gotta pay for your pizza sir is that a fact <laughs> how much do I owe you and it's perfect 
it lined up perfectly with what he needed to answer for the pizza delivery guy. I love the way that cosmically it all aligned so that the guy would only ask questions that he could answer with this pre-recorded film. <laughs> Keep the change, you filthy animal. <laughs> there was no reason for him to rub it into the bloody pizza guy, even though the asshole kept knocking over their statue. But the fact that he did was hilarious. I loved it. And then he tricks Marv with it later. And Marv thinks there's some shootout going on between the main guy and some dude called uh, Snakes. <laughs> but he sounded like a snake. So good. It's brilliant. I can't get over how hilarious the movie is. It has so many laugh out loud moments for me. Maybe these films were like tailored perfectly for my sense of humor. But there are so many moments and I'm discovering so many new moments that have me howling with laughter. Maybe other people don't find them as funny. But my God, re-watching them, I am just these little gem of a moment sometimes. That when you think about it, it's so much it's just so funny, the whole concept behind it all. Like the scene in number two in Lost in New York, when he meets the when he befriends the pigeon lady from the from Central Park and she takes him to the opera. And they're up the top there of the opera where she lives in like this old abandoned storage room. But she has a front row seat listening to all the orchestras and stuff like that. And she's pouring out her life story. She's telling him all the heartbreak that's happened in her life. How she lost the love of her life and she's been lonely ever since and been living this pathetic, lonely, sad existence. And then Kevin's like, yeah, I could totally relate. This one time I had rollerblades. And I, know, and I didn't wear them and I outgrew them. So this is just like your sad story, but you know. But the funny thing is, as funny as that is, that he equates it all to his rollerblades, there is some child wisdom in it. There's some actual true wisdom in it. Because it's like, you know, if you don't use your heart and open your heart up and take a chance, you know, eventually you won't be able to use it anymore because you'll grow too, too cold and bitter which is what she was on the verge of becoming. And so, yes, he used a childlike analogy with his rollerblades, but there was truth and wisdom in it. And that's what's great about the writing in this movie. It's layered, it's deep. You know, who would have thought a Home Alone movie would be deep, but it fucking is. You know, the heartwarming moments with Mr. Duncan as well, that was really nice. And how he left him that note on the brick, because he felt really, Kevin was a really good-hearted kid. You know, he only used his uh, strategic genius to take out these, uh, you know, evil criminals. He never used it to hurt anybody. He never had a malicious bone in his body. And even when he would retaliate against Buzz, it was because Buzz was being an asshole to him. You know, he was never malicious to people. And the traps he did was all self-defense. All right, and maybe he was a little bit malicious to the pizza delivery guy. But he was an asshole anyway. He kept knocking over their statue and he was a bit of a smart ass. And that was just a bit of fun. So, you know, I don't put that against Kevin. He still, in my opinion, was a good-hearted guy who always just wanted to help decent people, right? And the way he felt bad about destroying Mr. Duncan's window, but he had to do it to save the store. And he wanted to help so that the, the money that they stole would go to the kids at the hospital. Even the scene where, he, where he's missing his mum and they play that amazing tune from John Williams, who I never knew as a kid, John Williams, the, the maestro, the greatest musical composer of, you know, arguably the 20th century, perhaps, because of his amazing tunes that he did in, uh, you know, all those movie uh, themes, Superman, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Jurassic Park, and bloody Home Alone as well. I mean, people say, oh, that's not music. It is. It's an or it's orchestra music that he wrote. How is it any different to classical music? And these tunes are timeless, just like the others. They will live on. And uh, the music he has in those heartfelt moments where Kevin's missing his family and his mum is also missing it, and you can feel the bond between them because when Kevin cries out in the first one, she senses something's wrong on the aeroplane and then she realises because they have this bond. You know, parents have a bond with their children. And it's, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. Anecdotally, I can confirm it whether you believe me or not, folks, but when I was five years old, I was on the other side of the world with my mother, and my father was back home in Australia, and I fell over and smashed my teeth, 
which arguably would explain my uh, uh, appearance <laughs> nowadays. But I smashed all my teeth and was in great pain. I was only five years old. Very traumatic for me. And my dad, the night that happened, the moment it happened, he had a dream that I fell over, hurt myself, woke up, called my mum. She goes, how do you know that he's, he's hurt? And he said, I, I just, I dreamt it. I knew it. He felt it. Right? This is a real thing. Parents really can have a bond like that with their children. And Kevin has it with his mum. She senses something's wrong. And then even, and the music that usually plays, also in the second one, the scene where he's missing his mum and he's looking at the kid and the poor kid in the hospital who's sick and they wave at each other. Such a sweet moment. And when they reunite in both movies, in the first one, when you see old man Marley reunite with his son, brings a tear to your eye. Absolutely. And then when he reunites with his mum, and they exchange pleasantries that they love each other and give each other giant hugs. Beautiful moments. I loved that as a kid, it, seeing it. It always made me feel nice, those moments. And it's great now, having a family of my own, seeing that. Uh, reuniting with loved ones is always, uh, you know, a powerful thing and a great thing. And the scene where they reunite in the second one with the Christmas tree was also brilliant. You know? And the funny thing is, I never paid much attention to uh, Peter McAllister, the dad, played brilliantly by John Hurt, and a very, a very subdued performance. He saw, he at first he comes across as sort of a not interested sort of guy, uh, and uh, sort of subdued, and he doesn't do or say much in it. But even his subtle performance, I found hilarious at moments, like some of the comments he makes. Like, you know, he tries to crack a joke when they're telling the cops that they lost their kid, and he goes. But, luck, funnily enough, we never forget our luggage. <laughs> like, who the fuck would say that? But I guess, you know, in a moment of intense stress, maybe you would try to lighten the, uh, the mood and the atmosphere. And I swear, the movie just has so many great elements. You know, maybe I should have structured this review, but sometimes I like watching rambling long reviews on YouTube. So, you know, I like just talking off the top of my head and spewing out my thoughts. So, you know... If you've come this far along, thanks. Maybe you could consider liking, sharing, subscribing to this channel. I ain't done yet talking about Home Alone. I've still got a few more things that, you know, are buzzing around in my uh, head. But uh, Harry and Marv were great villains. The casting was impeccable with those two. And as I said at the start of this uh, rambling-ass review, all right, Joe Pesci... Now, as a kid, I only knew him as Home Alone. I never had the, uh, you know, luckily, I didn't see movies like uh, Goodfellas or Casino as a child. Because, man, I would have had nightmares watching Joe Pesci if that was the case. Because that guy is a brilliant actor. And for a guy of such small, diminutive stature to be so imposing on the screen, mainly in those gangster films, is, I mean, a testament to his acting ability. And... He plays Harry so well. Obviously, he can't have that same level of menace that he has in those films because they're fucking R-rated movies and this is, a, what, a PG film, right? But he still comes across as menacing. And I would say, especially in the second one, when he's sort of like a looming presence in that film coming after um, Kevin and they sort of cross paths several times. Kevin doesn't notice him at first, but he notices Kevin. And just to be able to ride that line between sinister and hilarious at the same time was, was brilliant. Now, Marv, nothing sinister about Marv. He's just straight out pure humor. And Daniel Stern absolutely nailed that role. And I watched a show on Netflix about the making of Home Alone. And they had a different guy initially playing Marv. And man, look, I don't know. I never saw... A finished product with that actor, maybe he could have pulled it off, but I can't imagine anyone else as Marv than Daniel Stern. Tall and lanky, with the crazy hair, the amazing scream. That was Daniel Stern's real scream in both movies. In the first one where he gets a tarantula on his face, and in the second one where he gets the pigeons all over him and he does that bloody, you know, falsetto level fucking scream. Amazing! <laughs> ah. Imagine having that as like your bloody uh, message tone, your text message tone every time you got it. It had Marv screaming. Ah, that would uh, annoy a lot of people. <laughs>
but he plays it so well. And man, do they cop a beating. Harry and Marv cop one of the worst beatings you'll ever see in a movie. And I love slapstick humor, all right? And it's nothing to... I don't love seeing people get hurt or anything like that. It's not about that. It's about... It's so comical because it's so absurd. It's so over the top. The violence is so over the top. It would kill any normal person in the real world that the fact that they just shake it off is what makes it so funny. And this is why I also found the Three Stooges hilarious and Abbott and Costello hilarious and the Marx Brothers when they did slapstick humor as well. All right? Slapstick humor can be funny when it's done well. All right? And in this movie, it was done bloody well. It was done perfectly. It was the perfect mixture of heart and comedy and slapstick. And the slap, the, the traps are ingenious. Every time I watch it, I still appreciate watching the traps. And like I said earlier, I still watch it with bated breath and anticipation, waiting for those traps. And it feels like the rest of the films, the first half, or the first three quarters of each movie is just like a reward. It's like an extra, an added extra bonus that you get to enjoy. It's like the appetizer and the traps at the end are the dessert, are the main, the main course and the dessert all rolled into one. Or maybe the dessert is the, uh, the dessert is the re, the reunion of the families and the nice heartfelt moment at the end. And then you always get that final laugh. You always get that final laugh. In the first one, it's Buzz saying, Kevin, what the hell did you do to my room? <laughs> it's always give you, let you leave the film with a chuckle. Same with the second one. Kevin, you spent $987 on room service. I don't know if that's the exact number, but it's 900 and something dollars on room service. Oh, and got a, I can't forget Rob Schneider's cameo. It wasn't really a cameo. He had a proper role in it as Cedric. He was brilliant as Cedric. The uh, bellboy. <laughs> and Tim Curry was so good as well in the second one. As the, uh, I don't know if it was a hotel manager or just the, just like the head of uh, administration there where you sign in. But he played it so well and he did, he did his amazing Grinch maniacal smile when he realizes it's a stolen credit card. And the sequence is even better in that one. The two sequences where he's fooled by the tape recorder in the shower with the get out of here you nosy little pervert or I'm gonna slap you silly and he's using he's using the bloody clown the blow up clown and he, and when he shakes his fist at him with that with the fake hand <laughs> it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen I quote the shit out of it all the time and when he finally uses that against them the next day. And he says, you've been smooching with everybody. Bony Bob, Little Mo with the gimpy leg, Cliff. And of course, the security guard's name is Cliff. Of course it is. It has to be. This is, again, what I'm talking about when I say the universe has to align in this perfect in-world movie, in-world universe of this film for the events. And it's obviously, you suspend disbelief, but it, it's just, it's, it's done so well. And it's so fucking funny that it works. It works. Oh, and my the other great cameo in it, Donald Trump, because the uh, the Plaza Hotel was owned by Trump at the time. And he had that great cameo where he's just in the lobby. And Kevin's like, oh, which way to the front desk? He's like, oh, over there. <laughs> great. I love seeing him in movies. He was in heaps of movies before he became president, back in the 90s, you know? And so it was. it's great to see him in there. It's great to see all these great actors that were in it, you know, and I just, I enjoyed the absolute hell out of it. Oh, I think I've covered everything that I could possibly think of. Like I said, the traps were fantastic. It's so over the top. Marv and Harry would have been dead 20 times over in each movie, but that's what makes it so fun and hilarious. They just walk away from blow torches to the head, uh, staple guns to the face and crutch. Uh, bricks to the head. Marv copping those bricks to the head is one of the funniest things you will ever see. And he keeps copping it over and over. And you can almost feel it hitting him. And he's got the shape of the brick on his face. Oh my God, is that one of the funniest things I've ever seen. All right. And... Eh, uh, 
I don't know what else to say. I've been rambling for a long time now, but these movies are worth a long appreciation, rambling ass tribute. All right, and that's what this is a tribute to Home Alone 1 and 2, some of the greatest comedies I've ever seen and probably ever will see. And as for those sequels, I said I'd get to the sequels. I haven't seen them all the way through, but just seeing just seeing a minute of each one, I could tell they're just dog shit. All right? And this is no disrespect to the filmmakers, all right? I'm sure they were trying, but obviously they didn't have a budget. They didn't have the writing of John Hughes. They didn't have the acting talents of, you know, Joe Pesci, Daniel Stern, uh, Catherine O'Hara, John Hurd, and, of course, Macaulay Culkin. They didn't have any of that talent on board, so I don't know why they even greenlit a, a sequel. I guess they knew, you know, they pump it out there and kids will watch it. It'll probably make money on DVD sales and all that, and they probably have. I bet they are profitable, the sequels, just in DVD sales or whatever. But as far as I'm concerned, they're not canon. I don't even treat them as existing in the Home Alone universe because they're just so subpar compared to the quality of uh, the first two movies. And... I tell you what, Home Alone 2 has got to be one of the greatest sequels of all time. I'm going to do another video eventually about what the greatest sequels of all time are. And Home Alone 2 has got to be one of the best. I still debate with myself which one is better, one or two. I can't decide. That's how close they are in quality. Because the second did what you would want any sequel to do. It took what was great about the first one and expanded it, built up on the lore within the, the film universe, added extra gags, made the traps at the end even more epic and, and made it an even more grand and drawn out sequence that you can just sit and enjoy. And so as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the best sequels of all time, just like Aliens is. It took what was great about Alien, although Aliens changed the genre and turned it more into an action film rather than a horror film that the first one was, a horror thriller. This one, it was still a straight comedy, but it took all the great elements of one the, the heartfelt moments, the great writing, the great dialogue that is super quotable. The second one's almost probably more quotable than the first one. So it was no mean feat to match the, the 10 out of 10 quality of Home Alone 1, but they did it with two. And ah, so I've got to say, if you've never seen them, you've got to watch them. They're some of the best comedies you'll ever see. All right? And... If you don't find these movies funny, I don't know. I can't help you, all right? Because humor-wise, obviously, we have completely different tastes. But I've never met a person who didn't love the first two movies, honestly. From my age, and even my own kids love them. And, and are quoting them and everything, just like I grew up doing. So it's great to be able to share something from my childhood with my own children. I always wanted to be able to do that. And thank God I can do that, all right? So I recommend you watch them. They're great. They're family-friendly. Uh, and just great for a laugh. If you ever feeling down, throw these movies on, and it'll pick it, your mood will lift instantly because <laughs> they're absolutely brilliant. So I think I'll leave it there. I've probably covered probably covered every aspect of the movies that I love. I I literally have nothing bad to say about them. Nothing. I don't think there's a dull moment in either one. There's nothing I would change about them. They are perfect movies. I've said before that Alien is a perfect movie, and it is, I believe. And I think these are perfect movies too. I, there's not, like I said, there's nothing I will change. There's no gags or jokes that are in, intended as jokes that are not funny in it. There's nothing in it that I, I think doesn't land in terms of a punchline or, or just when they were going for something funny and it and it wasn't funny. There's nothing that doesn't work in it. And yeah, that's all I could say. Long live Home Alone 1 and 2. Uh, it's a shame Macaulay Culkin's career sort of died out after this. He did a few m few other movies that were, you know, I guess he had Richie Rich. I think that was a bit of a bomb. Uh, although my kids love that as well. <laughs> and it's not, you know, it's a shame. It's a shame his career didn't really take off. But this is a tough thing about being a child actor, I guess. They, uh, they grow up a bit too soon. And plus, you know... There's a lot of dark elements in Hollywood that, you know, tend to prey on young ch child actors. So it's a shame that that happens. Hopefully the industry gets cleaned out. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wish Macaulay Culkin had made more movies and that his career had taken off more. But he had a lot of 
trouble in his family life as well. So I always felt sorry for him as a kid. He probably lived a very lonely existence as a child, uh, even though he was filthy rich. And, um, you know, I hope his career takes off again one day. Although all I ever see him doing is bloody uh, YouTube shows now. He just keeps, <laughs> he keeps going on to like Red Letter Media and other channels. Uh, and he's got his own podcast, I think. So anyway, good luck to him in the future. And like I said, check out Home Alone if you've never seen it. Uh, well worth the watch and a super high recommendation from me. It's a 20 out of 20 for the two movies combined. Uh, best damn comedies you could probably ever see. All right, folks, I'll leave it there. Thanks again. If you've listened this far, you're insane. I don't know why you did, <laughs> but thanks for sticking with me and my rambling crazy thoughts. Uh, much appreciated. Please, if you don't mind, like and sharing and subscribing. I really do appreciate it. Leave me comments if you agree or disagree. If you think I'm wrong or crazy or these movies are shit, then let me know. Uh, even though I think you're crazy if you don't like these movies. Anyway, take care. Be good. God bless. And I'll see you later.